welcome to Woodland United Methodist Church. It's wonderful to have you here and worship with us. This is an exciting time to gather in the house of God. And now let's prepare ourselves for the holiness of the experience of meeting with Jesus anew. And as we prepare ourselves now, now let us listen to our Woodland Weekly Updates. Good morning and welcome to our Woodland Weekly Update for the week of August 22nd. This afternoon at 5 o'clock, we will gather at Wesley Hall for our back to school tailgate. We look forward to seeing you all there. We'll have a food truck, volleyball, cornhole, and just a time to come together and celebrate this new year and gather with friends. We look forward to seeing you there. This afternoon at 5.30, during our tailgate time, we encourage all of our youth to come on out and hang out with Alec and just check in and see how the week is going. This will be a kind of a kickoff as we get started for youth group this fall. And this week, Saturday, August 28th and Sunday, August 29th, our United Methodist men will be hosting a pork barbecue. They'll be selling pounds for $10 a pound or a butt for $50 a pound. If you haven't already ordered your barbecue, please go ahead and check out our church website for more information or call the church office and order your barbecue this week. This Sunday, August 29th, during our worship service at 1030 a.m., we look forward to celebrating together as our drama team puts on the play, Jesus Was, Jesus Is. Come on out, bring a friend, and enjoy this special worship together. It's fall, and you know what that means. It's pumpkin time. Our first load of pumpkins arrive on September the 26th, so watch out for the signups to help volunteer during the week of our pumpkin patch during the month of October, or come on out and be a part of the unloading. There's something for everyone to do. During the month of September, we'll be offering a short-term study with Alec called Tech Time. Sometimes we all have issues figuring out our phones or our iPads. Come with your questions and share with Alec. Tomorrow, August 23rd, our scouting ministry begins back here at Woodland. Come on out and be a part of this exciting time as we welcome all of these young people into our doors and into this ministry. Listed in your bulletin each week is a list of persons to remember in your prayers. Please take a moment this week to lift them up in prayer, give them a phone call, or even send a card. And that's just a few of the things happening here at Woodland. As always, please remember to follow us on Facebook, YouTube, or check out our church website for more information. Please join me in singing hymn number 399, Take My Life and Let It Be.
And now let us hear the reading from the Old Testament. Today's is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 12 through 14. And it reads, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has instructed him? Who did he consult for his enlightenment, and who taught him the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? It is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now we come to our time of prayer, and let's begin with our congregational prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we receive you into our hearts this morning so that your thoughts may become our thoughts, your way our way, your love our love, your will our will. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, embrace us anew, transform us, remake and remold us into your image so that we may honestly live out your gospel of peace, hope, and love as we go forth from this place in your name. May everyone we meet along our way see more of you and less of us in all that we do and in all that we say. And, O oh Lord, as you come into this room anew, as you embrace us anew, as you hold us anew, as you come into this fellowship and allow us all to feel the touch of your grace, we thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing at this moment as you whisper, as you guide, as you inspire, as you direct, as you prepare us for what lies ahead. And Lord Jesus, we just want to know the peace of God in such a way that the joy of God will overwhelm us. And Lord, that we will hear your voice more clearly as, you allow, as we allow your Holy Spirit to fill us as you send your Spirit into us so that you can live in us and with us and through us. And as we let you in and we ask you to take over and take hold the miracle happens and we begin to notice, we begin to understand. And when the scriptures are read, we begin to hear your voice in the midst of it all. And we begin to know what it is that you want of us. And we begin to be ready to testify, to share, to witness to what we've heard, what we've experienced, what has happened in our lives and in our hearts with others, that it may happen in their hearts, in their lives, in their minds as well. And so, Lord, we thank you for all that you're doing for us. We lift up those who need a special touch upon their bodies, their minds, their spirits. Let them feel the touch of grace. Let them feel the hope that comes from you. Let them be overwhelmed by your spirit. And, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would touch those angels you send to them, doctors, caregivers, friends, those who just show up at the right moment to offer your kind word or your strength. And we pray, Lord, that even now those that you send will listen to your voice and be guided and be prepared and know they've been chosen just for that purpose to go and minister in your name and your spirit. And, Lord, as we thank you for what you're doing for all of these we lift up. Let the power of this prayer touch their hearts. Let the power of this prayer overwhelm them. Let them suddenly begin to feel better just knowing that you're there and that the people of God, your children, are praying for them and lifting them up in your spirit. And so, Lord, for all of these things, we thank you. We also thank you that we can testify to who we are, that we are the children of God, the people of God, the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we're the very body of Christ in service and love. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to testify that we are one in all of this, in these prayers and in this presence and in your spirit. And we testify to our oneness in you, Lord Jesus, by sharing together in the very prayer that you taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we come to the time of our service where we can give back to God what he has given unto us. Here at Woodland, you can give in several meaningful ways. You can go to the church website here and make a one-time gift or a reoccurring gift. You can follow the text message instructions on the screen to make a gift. Or you can always mail in your gift to the address here. 
No matter how you give, please take a moment to pray and consider how you can best serve not just Woodland United Methodist Church, not just Rock Hill, but the greater faith community. Thank you. Let us pray. God of power and might, through the ages you have reminded us through prophets and apostles that we are called to battle, not with one another, but against sin and terror. Let us use these gifts to the best of our abilities so that we can pour out on those in need, those that can come to us and those who can't, those who reach out and those who are too weak to. Let us do all of this in your holy grace. Amen. And now we come to our reading from the New Testament. It's 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 through 16. Paul is speaking. Yet among the mature we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age, or of the rulers of this age, who are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye have seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit is, that is from God. So that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. <clears throat> those who are unspiritual do not receive the gift of God's Spirit, for they are foolishness to them, and they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. 
Those who are spiritual discern all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now we're looking at this scripture about the mind of Christ, having the mind of Christ, the thoughts of Christ, knowing that Christ is here with us and we understand what it means to have Christ. Paul's a good example because Paul's really our example of salvation. He's our example of what it's really about to belong to Christ. Something has happened within the church that happened with all religious organizations and religious groups that happened to the, the Jews during a period of time after having been so close to God and listened to God and followed God as best they could. And the prophets would come and share God's word with them. There came a point where people began to believe, once again, that we can handle things ourselves. That all we got to do is, is study and understand, figure it out, that we have the brains to understand. We have the mind that can understand and all we got to do is find what we want to believe and then believe it. And we've got to listen to our own heart, we say, and see what speaks to us. I want to see what I want to do, where I want to go, and what I want to become. And so I'll go to the Bible and I'll see the Bible as some kind of an instructor to me. And in fact, there are people today who have taken that upon themselves so deeply that they will speak about, we believe in the authority of Scripture. And what they mean is that the Bible tells me and I look at the Bible and I discern it myself and I decide what it's trying to say to me or what I think God wants me to hear and then I go ahead and do what I think and I also like to go to the scriptures and just pick the scriptures that say what I already decided I want to do and where I want to go and how I want to act and I go to the scriptures to find scripture that says that God's going to be there to take care of me and keep me safe. And, and God's going to be there to, to do whatever I want him to do for me so that I can be happy with where I am right now in this world. I want to succeed in this world. I want to have in this world. I remember someone coming to me once and in a prayer session and he was wanting a new car. And I've shared this story on different occasions because it's fascinating to me he wanted a new car. And he went to us in, in a prayer session where people were talking about sickness and struggles and, and all that people were going through and people facing death. And he wanted to know if we would pray that he get this new car. And when he talked to us, it wasn't just the fact he needed a car, he needed transportation, but it was a specific car. It was a very expensive car. It was one that he had always wanted since he was young. And, and now he thought he had the money, he could probably get it. So he was hoping he would have enough to get this car. And please pray for me. And we may look at that and think that's ridiculous and that's silly and that's something that we shouldn't be spending time in prayer sessions about. But the truth is, much of what we pray for is much like him asking for his car. We go to God and we say, God, this is what I'd like to see happen. This is what I want. We may go to God and say, I've got an opportunity for a job that I think I would really love to have. So please, Lord, do whatever you can to make sure I get this job or this amount of money or this opportunity to, to get more money. All these things that we talk about are about us trying to take care of us and us going to the Bible to try to find some verse that will say it's okay for us to be this way and to think this way and care only about our success or our understanding in this world and praying for others that we care about that they also will get these wonderful opportunities. Instead of going to God and letting God fill us with His Spirit because you can't understand the Bible, you can't read the Bible and get anything out of it from God unless you're saved unless you've received the Holy Spirit unless you let God come live inside of you otherwise it's just a book that you read like any other book and you discern things out of it or you glean things from it that that speak to you that you like so often when people read read books they often will read the same type books and the same message over and over and over and over and when you say, well, I love that series this person did, or I love those books that they write because everything they say is what I want to hear. They rarely pick up a book that says something that challenges them or makes them question whether they're going in the right direction or not. But we don't read books for that purpose. We read books because we want to enjoy it. We want to experience something that makes us feel better. But when we go to the Bible, we can't treat the Bible like just another book. It's so much more. It's more like the parables of God. And when we pick it up, the words mean very little to us from God unless we have God, unless we let God live in us. So the first step is to let Christ in. And Paul 
tries to tell us and show us what that looks like. And when we read Paul saying these words, we will read it and say Paul was an amazing person. And we'll say Paul had this relationship with God that most of us don't have. But the truth is, Paul was saying that you all can have the same relationship with Christ, an intimate relationship, the presence of Christ here. And he can breathe on us like he did the disciples of old and say, receive the Holy Spirit. He can actually live inside of us. And we say those words, but if that happens, wouldn't that be miraculous? If that happens, wouldn't we be different? Would we look at the world differently if we're looking through his eyes? Would we think differently if we were thinking with his mind? And then what do we say? Oh, we're not Jesus. Don't expect too much of us. So we go backwards. We go back to the idea of religion being us just finding a book or finding some, some writing or finding some teaching that makes us feel better about our lives. Some teaching that allows us to continue to do things the way we've always done them but not feel so much guilt because we're not doing as much as we could. We're just human beings. We can't do this. Jesus is the one. So we reduce Jesus to a Savior who did something for us on the cross. And we say, oh, he did something for us. He was perfect. And he saved us. He did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. So now we're saved. But salvation is something that happens to you. Because to be saved is to believe that he died on the cross for you. And to believe that by dying on the cross, he opened a door that we can now experience and step through and the Spirit of God can truly come and live inside of us. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's not an it. When people say, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Have you received it? It's not an it. It's Him, God, inside us. Changes the way we look at things. Changes the way we think. And so this scripture tried to say that when Jesus said, I mean, when Paul said in verse 9, but as it is written, what no eye have seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love Him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, to the, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. It's that Spirit that changes everything. It's Christ within us who comes to us and lives in us, through us, and who sends us forth in His Spirit. And suddenly, we can actually have the mind of God. Imagine that. You don't want to admit that. You want to say you're so humble that you want to say, oh, I don't have the mind of God, for goodness sake. I don't have the mind of God. And then you love to quote the Old Testament scripture that my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts, saith the Lord. But that was before the Holy Spirit. That was before Jesus came. So he could tra change us. That's who we are apart from from Christ, apart from God coming to us to change all of that so that His ways do become our ways. His thoughts become our thoughts. When we love like Jesus loves, when we love unconditionally, not because we've been taught to, not because the Bible says in places you should love unconditionally, but because suddenly it's who we are. Suddenly we actually care for everyone. Suddenly there's no one we would ex exclude, reject, push aside, or say doesn't belong. Because I found a Bible verse that allows me to say that. We don't serve the Bible. We serve the Lord. And as I've said so often, I don't believe in the authority of Scripture. I believe in the authority of the one who speaks through Scripture. But he can't speak through it if you don't have him. You can't speak through it if we haven't turned our hearts over to him. And the Bible is not a weapon that we can use to justify our sin because our sin is exclusion. Our sin is rejection. Our sin is saying some people just don't belong. Our sin is saying that we don't have to be like Jesus. We don't have to do things the way he did things when he walked on this earth. We don't have to care for people the way he cares about people. We don't have to love even those that everyone else has written off. But when we meet Christ, something happens. That's what Paul was trying to say in his letters. He's trying to say, I was going in one direction, and now I'm going in another direction. And it's because of Christ. I was persecuting people, saying they didn't belong. I said Gentiles did not belong in the church of God. They were outside the will of God, and we should exclude them and push them aside. I was saying that Christians are sinners 
sinning against God, breaking the Bible's commandments, breaking the rules of the Bible. And you have to be careful right now because you have to realize that if you lived in that day with what many of us are saying is what following Christ is today, just following the rules and saying that we can take control of our own faith and do what we think is best. And we don't have to care about what Jesus would do because we're not Jesus. We're just going to do what we think is best and hope Jesus gives us a little credit for what we're doing. But we don't believe he's here. We don't believe he's with us. We don't notice him in the room. We don't notice him holding us. We don't hear his voice when he speaks and tells us what he wants of us, even if it's not what we want to hear. We don't hear any of that. And whenever I hear people say that or others share with me talking with someone and they're talking about their faith and their love of God, he said, but Jesus is still talking to us. And I say, oh, no, 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 no. He stopped that a long time ago. He, he doesn't talk to us anymore. But the reason you don't hear him is you haven't let him live inside of you. If he lived inside of you, you would hear him. If you let his spirit fill you, you would notice him. And suddenly the way you see the world changes. So the gospel is for the saved. I mean, the written gospel is for the saved. The gospel of Jesus Christ is what he can do to a person who surrenders their life to him, who give up and let him take hold and let him send and do whatever he wants to do, who says, I'm yours, Lord, and I'm ready to change. If you can't say those words right now, Lord Jesus, I'm ready to change and become like you, your follower, your disciple. I want you to do to me whatever you have to do so that I can become like you. There's a song that will make me like you. Make me like you. You are a servant. Make me one too. Oh, Lord, I want to do what you do. Just make me like you, Lord. Make me like you. Whatever you do, Lord, make me like you. And then Jesus touches you as he touched Paul. And Paul said in Galatians that the day came when God who called me before I was born, revealed his son in me. Think about Paul. What happened to him? That radical change in the way he saw the world is what's required of us all if we want to honestly call ourselves Christian. If we honestly want to call ourselves followers of Jesus, that that means when people look at us, they see Jesus in everything we say and everything we do, where we go and how we serve. So today, we're listening to the words of God. Christ in me makes it possible for me to stand up for all people who are hurting or suffering or being excluded or pushed aside and ignored. Christ inside of me makes me love even those who don't love you back. That's unconditional love. You don't have to love me back. You love because Christ is inside of you and that love has taken over your life. And you love because you know that Christ is real and that he's here. And you know it because he's with you. And you listen now and you hear his voice because you let Jesus save you. And who does he save us or what does God save us from? And we often say he's saving us from hell so we don't go to hell someday. He's saving us from us, from us who have separated ourselves from God, from us who treat God as just someone we will turn to when we want something or turn to when we feel desperate and we can't do it ourselves that day. We turn to him or someone we want to just affirm whatever we want to do, an advisor. I'll go to you, Lord, and ask your advice, and then I'll do what I think is best. And we'll claim it's God telling us to do this. If you don't see him, if you don't hear his voice, if you don't have his thoughts and his compassion, if you don't have his unconditional love that the world can't understand, if you're not peculiar and different in that way, then you haven't let Jesus have you. You haven't received that kind of salvation that changes everything about you and makes everything about him. 
So let's remember that today. As we surrender ourselves to Christ, as we let Jesus come in, as we believe like Paul, and we can say with Paul now, if you can't say this with Paul, then you need to come to Christ today. When Paul said in Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And if you can't say that as Paul said it, then go to Christ now and say, I want you to live in me, Lord, like you lived in Paul. I want you to live through me like you did in Paul. I want you to change the way I look at people in the world the way you changed the way Paul looked at people in the world. I want to see through your eyes, Lord, and only your eyes and your heart, Lord, and only your heart. And I want to go forth and know, not think or suggest or even just say, I believe. I want to know that you're right here with me and in me and through me. And I know there's nothing I do, nowhere I go, that you're not there in the midst of it all. And let people look at me and see you. Go forth in the name above all names of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.